Hello, everybody. Delisa Hawking here. I am delighted to have you join us today on the Spirit and Spark TV channel here on YouTube. You may recognize Dr. Lisa Thompson. She was one of our featured speakers at the recent Planets and Prediction Summit. I'll be honest, she was one of those speakers that I received a lot of positive feedback about. Great comments. People loved what she shared. And I recently was looking at her social media accounts, as I often do, and she posted something that caught my attention. We're going to be talking to her about that in just a couple minutes. But before I introduce uh, her into the conversation, I want to tell you a little bit more about her in case you don't know her and you didn't catch her at the summit. So Dr. Lisa Thompson is a best-selling author, speaker, galactic ambassador, and intuitive transformational coach specializing in human design and past life regression. She's actually been working with several people as a result of the summit on visiting their galactic families and learning more about their origins there, which is fantastic. She has written the book, Sacred Soul Love, Manifesting True Love and Happiness by Revealing and Healing Blockages and Limitations. She's also written Sacred Soul Spaces, Designing Your Personal Oasis. And she has her newest book, which I'm sure we'll be talking about, Connection to the Cosmos, Remembering Your Galactic Heritage and Embracing Your Oneness. She teaches online classes, she leads retreats, and she lives in Hawaii, which is amazing. She has created eight Oracle decks, and she has a brand new deck that accompanies uh, the book as well, uh, a great combination to work with, and uh, it's under the same title, Connection to the Cosmos, and she also leads Night Skywatch UFO Tours on the big island of Hawaii, so I'm definitely going to ask about that. <laughs> All of her work, everything you can find at drlisajthompson.com. I will put it in the description below so everyone can just click on it, make it easier to get to your website. So welcome. Hey, I'm so happy to be here with you again. I thank you so much for having me part of the summit. <laughs> so. It was fun. I'm not kidding. You had so many people. <laughs> cheering and excited and um yeah and I love talking about galactics and and UFO sightings and all that good stuff so we have a lot to get into today um you posted on your social media account recently that you felt like cats were aliens and we're going to talk about that because I have two cats you've got cats I've had cats my whole life uh, so we're going to dig into that. So everybody stay tuned. Um, we're also going to talk about the book that you recently uh, published. So let's start there. Uh, how did you get started with working with galactic beings, being interested in UFOs? Like, how did this all come to be? So what I understand now is I've been an experiencer my entire life of UFO and alien phenomena. And I, I grew up kind of in an unconventional household where my mother was into metaphysical sciences, astrology, psychic work. Um, she had witch friends, tarot card reader friends. So um, I was always open to other things existing. And when I was 13, we moved to a different state we, um, to go to a spiritual school of enlightenment, the Ramtha School of Enlightenment. And in that school, we were learning about higher dimensional entities and our connection to source, creating your reality. And part of that was learning that fairies are real, extraterrestrials are real, and other things of that nature. Well, when I was 15, I had my first conscious memory of being taken into a craft. And I write about that in the book, um, just one little section. But this experience, it was a like truly beautiful experience. There was nothing scary about it. And um, I actually was able to have that experience validated by a high government official that knew about the different alien races. And so having, having that validation as a teenager was huge. And I think that, that memory of getting to remember it because I had had other experiences that, you know, they're way, way back in the subconscious mind that I wasn't allowed to remember at that time but this one was a seed being planted for the work I do now as galactic ambassador almost 35 years later. And so 
you know, it's been a long process of feeling comfortable of speaking out about this, because even though I knew my experience was real, when I would tell people, they thought I was crazy, right? They're like, and I come from a science world. I'm an evolutionary biologist with a PhD and all of my friends were like, okay, yeah, Lisa's a little weird. And, <laughs> and so with my mainstream careers that I had up until about five years ago, oh, and we have the cats in the background. I love it. I love when cats show up. I love when all animals show up. <laughs> yeah, the, ba the baby is uh, antagonizing the, one of the older ones. So, okay, we're gonna keep going. So um, anyway, I finally, am at a place in my life where I feel like it's okay. Yeah, they're right. going for it. They're, oh, they're okay. About, there are uh, no cats harmed in the production of this video. Know. Yeah, and we're talking about cats are aliens. So here's what we'll talk about that later. Um, so really now is the time where those like me that have had experiences it's time for us to stand up and speak out about this to normalize it in society. And it was four years ago this month that I met my Arcturian family, which was a totally different group than what I had been taken by as a teenager, but they were working in conjunction with each other. And so now in the last four years, I've developed this really beautiful connection with the Arcturians. I know what my role is in my Arcturian life. So even though we, you said I'm, I do past life regression, um, trying to change that terminology to either parallel life regression or other life regression, since all timelines exist simultaneously. So I do have a life as an Arcturian where I'm a healer sending energy healing down to Lisa here on earth that then extends out onto earth. And I've started channeling them this year as well through writing and vocalizing. So really and then with that connection then other groups have started coming in as well that's spectacular um when you think back about the experience you had as a teenager and it sounds like they then gave you that seed that um guidance perhaps of what you were going to be doing you know throughout your life and how you would be helping so when you reflect on that experience that you had as a teenager, is it one that is light and happy and loving? Yeah. So, and I don't want to take up too much time with that story, but I will go into a little more detail. So at the time, it was 1988. We were in the middle of the Cold War still. And, you know, so nuclear threat was pervasive. We were on the verge of World War III. And when I was taken, um, I was taken to Io, which is one of Jupiter's moons. And we were inside of Io. And I was being toured around the facility. I could see other earth humans. And my question to them was like, why am I here? Why are they here? And the answer was that we were chosen to be tested to see if physiologically, genetically, if something happened to the earth, that we could be taken to this kind of environment or something similar. And again, so back, it made sense back in the time that we were in. And so this was a group that the Arcturians had asked them to help with me specifically because of my connection with them. Um, and so part of, part of that is there are so many different helper races, family races of extraterrestrials, higher dimensional beings, that want us to survive. They don't want us to destroy ourselves. And so now in the time that we're in, things are getting darker again, right? And so there's a lot more activity going on over the last couple of years even um, that people are experiencing because they are, we have free will, so they can't intervene directly, but they are trying to connect and make sure that we know that like they're our family. They're benevolent. They want us to survive. They want to help us. So what year was that when you first were taken to the moon? Uh, 1988. Wow. Pretty cool. Thanks yeah. for sharing a bit more about that. Because I know that if I didn't ask, people would, <laughs> would be wondering more about that story. So uh, well, one, of, one of the things I'd like to add just real quick is that it was a completely different race than the gray 
um, alien race that was really taking people in that time period. Um, Whitley Strieber wrote a book, Communion, about his experience of be being taken by the Greys. And so part of how I got my validation before I talked to this government guy was um, I, I came back thinking it was a dream. And my group, they were like seven feet tall, pure white skin, red, long hair, and big dark eyes. So really, but they, they camouflage themselves to look human at first. I only got to see what they really looked like because I was curious and wanted to know who they actually were and see them. But to all the other humans in this facility, they were, they looked very human, you know? And so when I was reading Whitley's book, at the very end, he's interviewing other people that had been taken onto craft and had experiences. They all had the same kind of story as Whitley being taken by the Greys, except for one guy had a completely different story where he told he was told he was one of the chosen ones and taken to a moon of Jupiter. And Whitley made a little side comment, I hope it isn't Io. And when I read that, my body went in full head to toe chills. I had tears coming down my eyes. And so that was my body's way of saying, okay, that was real. That wasn't a dream. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know I want I want to see like the sketches and I want to, you know, oh gosh, my my visual brain starts going into wanting to know more. So we'll, yeah. we might have to talk more about that at another time. <laughs> uh, beautiful. So you do these UFO sighting excursions in Hawaii. I've, I've got to just ask you about that because I'm intrigued by it. Have you had any experiences? I'm sure you see things regularly as mm -hmm. you do those night tours. Is there anything that kind of comes to mind that you want to share with folks today? Yeah. So what we do, um, I actually, there are other tours like this um, in Sedona. And that's five years ago. That's where my family and I first experienced going on a UFO tour. And we use military night vision goggles, Gen 3 military night vision goggles specifically. And so I had already seen a lot of UFOs, you know, have all these experiences. <laughs> We're just going to keep going. <laughs> I can't, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll explain that later. So, um, yeah. So when we moved here to Hawaii two years ago, we realized we, we had moved from Washington state where Western Washington, it's cloudy like nine months out of the year. And there's no way we could have ever done any kind of regular UFO tour there. So when we got here to Hawaii, I'm on the big island in Waikoloa in the middle of the desert, clear skies most nights. And we realized how much activity there really is here on this island, around the, all the islands too, but this island is heavy with activity. And so um, when we, the, the coolest one that we saw recently, it was maybe a week ago, um, it was a family of four, local family of four, and my husband and I, and we saw this squiggle at first in the sky with the goggles, and that squiggle started turning into a full shape, but it was invisible in the middle where you could see the stars through it, and then it was getting closer and closer, bigger and bigger, and we could see a craft that was like I don't know if it was slightly higher dimension or if it was just kind of camouflaging where you could see the outline of it, but there were stars in the middle of it. So it might've been reflecting, um, you know, kind of like the invisibility cloak, but where you can see an outline. <laughs> uh, so that was one thing. Another night, um, it was super cloudy. And so we weren't able to get the goggles out, but through the clouds, and it was not a, a moon night either, very crisp, laser sharp pyramid through the clouds, giant in the sky. And so those are some of the ones that we could like visually see with even just our eyes without the goggles. Um, but, you know, we see colored orbs, big orbs and other glowing things. And then all the time we see some random different blinking lights or things that look like satellites that will disappear in the middle of the sky where they shouldn't be disappearing or appearing in the sky, like where they shouldn't be appearing and then moving. Uh, it's so fun. The next time I'm in Hawaii, we're gonna go. And everyone listening to this, if you're going to Hawaii, the big island, if you know anybody that's going, make sure you link up 
and go on this tour and go check out what you can see up in the sky. Oh my gosh. We could sit here and talk for hours and hours, but we got to keep moving along. I know. (laughs) Yeah. I love that your cats have been so incredibly vocal uh, during our interview today, because that's what sparked the entire uh, invitation to come. I mean, obviously, I just want to talk to you more because I'm fascinated by the work that you do. But the post that you did that I mentioned at the top of this interview, you said that cats are aliens. So yours are active today. They've obviously got a lot to say. I follow an astrologer who has a cat. And when she starts talking about different aspects and energy, the cat will start meowing. Okay. Um, so cats are very interactive. They know yeah. a lot more than I think most people give them credit for. Mm-hmm. But you've got to explain to me what you mean by cats or aliens. Okay. So, I mean, even though I, I am an evolutionary biologist, zoologist, with normal mainstream training of kind of the evolution of progression of animals, um, some animals are really hard to explain with that evolutionary history and cats are one of them in terms of just how like out there they are. So when we first got our cat Bindi, um, she, I knew right away, I'm like this, I think this is her first earth cat life. She was so spacey, like she was so such from outer space and I've had cats my entire life and I'm like, okay, yeah, she's definitely a little alien. And then, at, you know, as, I've gotten even deeper into understanding this alien extraterrestrial phenomena, then I I realized, okay, well, number one, there are a lot of different feline humanoid extraterrestrials that come from different star systems. And some of those have come to earth as the gods and goddesses as well. And cats have been a very integral part of some different spiritual mythology around the world, not just in Egypt, because Bastet would be probably the most famous of the goddesses that is a cat humanoid, right? A feline humanoid. But we have um, Freya in the Nordic tradition where her chariot was driven by two cats, two male cats, not horses, but by cats. And then there's a Peruvian shape-shifting god that turns into a cat named Mochica. And then in China, there's a cat god. In Poland, there's a black cat god. Hecate, in Greek mythology, she is able to shape-shift into a cat. We have, um, in the Celtic tradition, we also have a cat, a goddess who's attended by white cats who go out and do her bidding. (laughs) essentially. And then in Africa and other Native American cultures, there's just this rich connection with cats being otherworldly. Now, so that's just some different examples from around the world and from ancient times. But even with that, so in some of the regressions that I've done, um, I have had some of my clients go to their cat their feline humanoid lives in different star systems and experience being that kind of hybrid being. And then my friend April um, in Texas, the one that I think I introduced you to. So she actually saw a cat fully coming out of a vortex portal where you could see the portal coming out from behind the cat, like kind of out of its back end area, fully stepping in. And, and then sometimes you might see the cat like full, like looking up into space and like doing this weird kind of transmission potentially Mm -hmm. with the higher realms. So there's a lot of um, different ways that you can look at this phenomena with the cats, but they really are um, truly their own unique kind of group of animals. You know, if you compare them to dogs or other kind of domesticated animals. (laughs) Yeah, they are very different to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I've, I've had cats my whole life. I have two now. And I talk to them as if they were human. Yes, me too. <laughs> like full on conversations. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, t- <laughs> this is probably t- TMI, but I'll turn the radio on, I'll dance around the house and they just kind of sit there and like, <laughs> 
treat them like they are an equal. Um, yeah. And I do, I think they have a lot more going on underneath that fur than we give them credit for. Yes. Well, and you know, one of my kids, so Bindi's the new space kitty, but um, my cat Chana, she is this wise, really grounded kind of Zen cat. So even though her origins might be extraterrestrial, like she has incarnated as a cat many times on earth to be this fully like grounded. She's almost gar gargoyle like. <laughs> <laughs> just watching over and she knows everything that's going on. Wow. I want everybody watching this to drop in the comments of the video. What do you think about cats being, you know, having galactic origins or do you feel like cats that you maybe have had now or in your life, maybe have some of this uh, where they've been reincarnated a few times. So I'd love to hear everyone's cat stories in the comments. <laughs> I will read every single comment. So drop well, them down. <laughs> there are other animals that we have here on earth that are really thought to be extraterrestrial as well, like octopus, right? Have you heard that? No. Yeah. So, and there's a little more mainstream science coming out about that too, just because they're, they are so different than other animals and even they're part of phylum mollusca, but they're still so different. And so they, one speculated thing is that maybe they um, they originated from some kind of asteroid or meteor remains that landed on Earth. Yeah. Um, sharks are another group, the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins. Um, they are believed to have originated from the Sirius star system. I'm taking all kinds of notes. <laughs> Again, even though, again, I'm like, I'm a traditionally trained evolutionary biologist from the University of Chicago and the Field Museum of Natural History, I am open-minded enough to know that we have all these missing links. And even though the fossil record does not have all of the, like, here's all the transitions. And so there are different times where potentially we had external help in experimentation, just like with our human form. And I talk about that in the book as well, the evolution of the humanoid form through the galaxy and basically how we started as earth humans. I wanna talk about your book. If you wouldn't mind holding it up because I was telling you before we started recording, I love the cover of your book. It is such a beautiful book. And I mean, I'm so sensitive to energy. And when I look at it, I feel, expansive and I want to know you've obviously written books before you have eight oracle decks and the new oracle deck you created why were you feeling inspired to write this new book connection to the cosmos remembering your galactic heritage and embracing your oneness what sparked this okay so really um when we started doing our ufo tours just over a year ago I was sharing my stories with our guests and I'm, I'm a just natural writer, I guess. I'd never thought I would be a writer, but I was, I started writing blogs about my stories and I had a few friends say, there's a book coming, there's a book coming. <laughs> and so that, that was the little seed planted that, okay, people are interested in this information. I didn't know if people would be interested or if they would just think I was crazy. And so I really, it was going out on kind of a limb of our people, my tribe that's used to me being um, definitely spiritual, but not talking about galactic stuff per se. Um, you know, would they be accepting of that? And they have been. And because of the take that I have in this connection with my Arcturians and really understanding the higher perspective of these beings and understanding our third dimensional, fourth dimensional polarity reality. Um, and beyond that, it's just love and unity. And so really they, the Arcturians really want me to start sharing that message of love and unity to raise the vibration. And just, I'm one of the many people who's here to be a light and to be my authentic self right there's no more hiding 
and the more that is going on on the earth, we're going to have more and more. Um, here's one of the babies. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so this What's is this one's name? One is Tom. This is the one that my daughter brought home back in July. <laughs> Hi, Tom. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, so it's time because there's more and more disclosure that's going to be happening, but more and more people are having their own personal experiences. And that's actually more important that in my mind than the government disclosing stuff, because this really is a personal connection with our galactic family and guides. And I love the sessions that I've been doing since the summit with people because everyone's having their own unique experience but the experience, it's real. When we go deep into our mind in that meditative journey, that is real. That is you actually connecting to higher consciousness. And the client I had yesterday, you know, it, it was actually a feline human, humanoid group that came to her and she was one of them. Like that's the information we got. So she actually has a life as one of these feline humanoid beings. And so the more that people are experiencing that they are more than just this one human earth life, then it, it opens up possibilities for not being afraid of death, for understanding the differences between ourselves on earth, for having more love and compassion, and really being able to expand out to be part of that greater galactic family. I love all of that because I was going to ask you like, oh, who's the ideal you know, person that should read this book? But after hearing you speak about your motivations, what inspired you to write this book, everyone should read this. Yeah, I think it helps them to think above and beyond themselves, where they came from, where they're living other parallel lives now. It's yeah. going to open your mind in ways that maybe it's not currently open um, and, yeah. and help you revisit all those pieces. So well, and some, yeah. some of the feedback I've gotten is people feel validated and seen because they've had their own kind of experiences that they never knew how to put into perspective or they maybe thought it was a dream or that they were crazy. And so this helps them realize, oh, okay, maybe that was real. And I'm there, there are other people out there. But I also try, I've got a whole range of information from someone who doesn't know anything about any of this to give some background to the most experienced person to deepen that connection even more. I appreciate all of the work that you're doing and continue to do because I feel like we're here on earth right now living in a human body. Uh, there's a lot that's going to be unfolding um, that we're going to bear witness to. And I do think that there will be more and more of these experiences that we're having. And we're going to need really to connect with people like you more and more um, so that we can have a better idea and sense of what's going on and how to navigate it. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Well, and there's so much fear right now even at, with this topic, the media, the government, the Hollywood, um, the most of the information they're putting out is trying to put a fear-based spin. If we have to perceive this as a threat, absolutely we do not have to perceive this as a threat. Use your own true inner wisdom and connection to understand that. Important note to end on for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna link your website, your book below. Everyone, please go and check it out. If you're interested in doing a one-on-one -on -one session, grab it. I'm going to be doing one myself um, that I'm excited about. Um, doctor, so D-R and then Lisa J Thompson.com. Again, I'm including it in the link below. Uh, where else do you want people to connect with you uh, online? Um, I am very active on Facebook. So I have uh, two different pages, Big Island UFO Tours and Dr. Lisa Thompson. And then I have two very active groups, Connection to the Cosmos, and then Sacred Soul Spaces with Dr. Lisa Thompson. And then I do have a YouTube channel as well, which is Connection to the Cosmos with Dr. Lisa Thompson. Beautiful. Everybody go make sure you connect, uh, engage online, get a session if you feel called to. But I feel like everyone needs to get a copy of this book. 
and uh, immerse themselves in everything that you're sharing with us. So thank you for spending some time with us today. And thank your cats. Give them all pets for me. <laughs> now, now they're calm. Now they're like, oh, the interview's over. <laughs> now we can be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they were speaking up and validating what you were sharing today, which I always appreciate. So Dr. Lisa Thompson, thanks for being a part of the show today. Thank you so much. Thanks.